Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Wood. I'm the Programs Director for Early Music America, and I want to welcome you all to this special conversation here on Early Music Day 2021. It's also International Women's History Month, uh, and we have some, uh, some amazing women here with us today to talk about historical dance uh, in many different facets uh, of, of what that can mean. Uh, we've had a wonderful response over the last few months as part of our Well-Tempered Musician Wellness Series as we've offered some uh, Baroque dance sessions, and we've had great response to those, uh, including a lot of questions. So we thought it would be um, appropriate to bring these experts uh, onto a call together so that we can uh, address some of those questions. We can talk a little bit about um, what, what it means to, to be involved in dance and what are some ways that you can further your own journey if it's something that you're interested in or uh, want to continue learning about if you've already started. Um, and also to talk about how this fits into things like music making um, in terms of uh, you know, uh, interpreting earlier styles of music through the dance forms that were associated uh, with with that music. And so I want to welcome our panel today. Uh, and we are going to uh, have them each introduce themselves. And I've asked them each to, uh, to let you know uh, the way that they were first introduced to period dance and sort of what was the spark that got them into uh, pursuing this as, as a part of their career. So I'm going to start alphabetically with uh, Julie Andrzejewski. So uh, Julie, if you just introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. It's good to see everyone there. Um, I am a Baroque violinist and dancer, and I've spent all of my life dancing and playing. I started at around age five doing both. So it's kind of something that I've always done. I came to Baroque dance through uh, the Baroque Performance Institute when I went there as a, a new Baroque violinist. And I discovered that uh, Elaine Biaggi Turner was there um, teaching Baroque dance. And that was a real treat to me. She was a wonderful teacher. So that's how I got started. Um, now I work almost exclusively with musicians. I've done a lot of performing in the past, but right now I mainly uh, teach and research and uh, I direct some and choreograph. Uh, this is my 12th year as a full-time faculty at Case Western Reserve University, where I teach music and dance uh, throughout the school year. I also teach a movement class at uh, the Cleveland Institute of Music, and I'm involved with their opera department as movement coach and choreographer. And I also teach workshops um, at various uh, academic institutions, including Juilliard twice a year and summer festivals. And I just want to produce healthy and inform musicians, and I want to do that through Baroque dance. Thank you. Sarah, Edgar, would you please go next? Hello. Um, so I live in Chicago. And I am the stage director and choreographer for uh, Haymarket Opera Company. And I'm an associate director of the New York Broke Dance Company under Catherine Tarosi. And Catherine Tarosi is the person who really introduced me to Baroque dance when I was in college at Ohio State. Catherine Tarosi and Karen Elliott worked together to make a, a Baroque um, opera ballet, and it wasn't an opera ballet, a Baroque ballet. And I just happened to audition for it and fell in love immediately. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, we have uh, Marie Nathalie La Courcière. Uh, yes. Please. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm from Montreal. I live in Montreal. And um, I started to Baroque dancing more than 25 years ago, 30 years, something like that, I was a student at the university in music. And that's how I got into wow. um, Baroque dance. And But when I finished my bachelor, I became a Baroque dancer. So you never know what, what happened. So I studied um, at the beginning with Wendy Hilton a lot in the States. Uh, that's my connection with the USA. And uh, I end up uh, teaching at Stanford in her workshop, uh, the last years of uh, the workshop. And uh, because I did some studies in theater as well, I'm a stage director as well, a bit like Sarah. Uh, so I 
stage uh, many Baroque opera and I work in un different universities, Montreal universities and McGill and uh, a conservatory. So, um, and I met Julie at Stanford, I think, and that's where we, we met there. We were young and beautiful. Um, so yeah, so that. <laughs> <laughs> and I did a workshop with Catherine as well in, uh, yes, in um, Marin. In, exactly, exactly. I did the workshop a, a long time ago, too. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, Peggy. Yes, hi, everybody. I'm Peggy Murray. Um, I'm a, an old ballet and jazz dancer who stopped that because of injuries many, many years ago. But then I realized that people were were researching how people danced to early music. Hooray, that was my favorite kind of music anyway. So I got involved in looking at looking up uh, workshops, things like that. And the very first Baroque dance workshop I ever went to was one with Catherine Tarosi in Napa, California, many years ago. Um, and since then, I've been uh, doing a lot of research and doing various uh, workshops here and there. And I did a PhD in performance studies where I focused on historical performance, particularly in Latin America. And I now do a lot of teaching at workshops and at different university programs, things like that. So glad to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. And, uh, and Catherine, you've been mentioned a few times already. Uh, if you introduce yourself. Uh, Catherine Tarosi, and I'm the uh, artistic director of the New York Baroque Dance Company, co-founded with Ange Jacoby, who was uh, my roommate and also uh, danced with the Baroque Dance Ensemble at Ohio State University. And uh, Julie, of course, uh, Elaine Biagi Turner was also my roommate, and she was also dancing in the Baroque Dance Ensemble. So I was introduced to um, Baroque Dance through Shirley Wynn, who was teaching at Ohio State. And uh, she formed a company called the Baroque Dance Ensemble, which uh, in its sort of professional uh, existence lasted until, uh, lasted about a year after we left Ohio State and moved to Santa Cruz. When it dissolved with those people in it, including Elaine and Anne Jacoby, uh, I moved to New York and uh, I had already met James Richmond, harpsichord and conductor. Um, and since Anne and I were being asked to dance, we thought we should really form a company because that way we could raise money to um, help uh, our productions, to help have better productions. And we were also interested in protecting the dancers in terms of disability insurance um, and, and other things. So that's why we decided to have the company. Um, so I do stage direction, choreography, teaching, uh, lecturing, and uh, Zoom experiences like this. <laughs> yeah, as we're all very, very acquainted with uh, at, this, at this point, one, one year plus on. Um, well, once again, thank you everyone uh, for, for joining us uh, today. It's, it's great to have you all here and the wealth of experience that you all uh, represent. So as part of this wellness series that we've been uh, offering uh, Baroque Dance as part of our physical wellness aspect of the wellness series, um, Baroque Dance uh, and period dance has been considered a, an aspect of, of exercise and not just uh, not just a pure art form uh, for a long time. And so I, I'm not sure uh, which of you might be the, the most acquainted with this, but since many of you have, have, have researched it, um, would anyone like to talk, uh, or could anyone please uh, talk a, a little bit about uh, this dance as part of the regimen of, of, of a healthy lifestyle um, in, in terms of its uh, period approach? Does anyone have uh, experience with that? I mean, I think all of us do, um, but I'll start by talking about the, the courses that I do at CASE with my musicians. Um, and a lot of that is based on uh, how to carry your body. And uh, we warm up with some mindfulness exercises uh, just to get focused into the core and um, you know, reading the old treatises, it seems like this mindfulness and body awareness is something new. But when you read the treatises, you see that they were always aware of it and always bringing it to their, their lives and to their dance and to their movement. Um, so I like to, to focus on that and, and finding a noble ease 
throughout the dance class and also with my musicians when I teach them lessons and uh, watch them perform, just, just talking about getting into this noble ease and uh, it opens up not only the body, but the sounds as well. Can you explain, can you explain that a little bit, noble, noble ease? So when you, <laughs> when you, when you approach that, uh, how, how is that, how do, you, um, how do you explain that to students? Um, well, first of all, I talk about the core, right? Because the core is where everything is centered. And then I talk about feeling your shoulder blades going down your back, like floating down your back. And that without saying, you know, opening your chest, because they like to do that when you say open your chest. If you think about the back and just relaxing the shoulder blades down, then it automatically opens up this part of your body and lengthens your neck a little bit. I also talk about the head being on the spine and the chin being level, which are other um, parts of this uh, noble ease. Um, but yeah, if I, if I say open the chest, then I often get tension. And what I try to do is, is get release and relaxation and the sense that you only activate the muscles that you need to do whatever you're doing at that moment. And this also applies to playing instruments. Um, and helps that a lot too. Uh, and Marie, Nathalie, I know you're also trained um, in in Feldenkrais, uh, and uh, about you know, and which is all about body awareness um, and uh, that. So how do you how do you see those two things, uh, your your dance and your your Feldenkrais? Mm -hmm. learning? Yes. Uh, before I go to that, to that, I was thinking when Julie was uh, talking about the costumes because my and I see mm -hmm. that has costumes in the back. Uh, my mother is a costume se seamstress, and sometimes she did work from the or original patterns. And actually, the original patterns put you in a position that you cannot be like this. Um, the juste au corps and the vest. If you do it with the the, the um, it really puts you that uh, in in a position as well, that noble uh, easiness. Uh, but yes, the, my Feldenkrais really, um, when I did, um, when I was interested in somatical work, um, I was doing my master in dance and I discovered the Feldenkrais and it really changed actually how I work in uh, many different aspects. Um, how I stage, how I will work with, with, with the dancer because in Feldenkrais, the focus is not of uh, tr uh, in a model that you have to copy. You have to find uh, with the structure you have, the body, you have to organize yourself, uh, organize how you move with what you have, with uh, the weakness, not the weakness, but the, the hurts that you have. I don't have many, the, uh, maybe not the right word, but if you have, a, if you had any operation, if you, so you organize yourself. So it means the focus is not on absolutely uh, going, um, doing it one way, but is how can I do it differently? How can I organize? And my knee hurts. How can I do the bourrée steps? How can I? So it really changed how I work with the singers as well um, as the posture, not trying to say this is the posture that you have, but OK, what do you feel? Where is the weight under your feet? Uh, where do you feel your shoulders are? And then, um, and even in staging, instead of focusing, I want this, what do I see? And maybe Sa Sarah can reflect and even Catherine on this. Uh, what, what do I see? And I want to obtain something, but the person is not like me. So, okay, I can do it a certain way, but if I look at the person, how would be her way to do what I want in in uh, in a way, so that's a bit how um, the yeah the Feldenkrais and the really change how how I see and how I worked. Yeah, that's it. So what Marie Natalie was saying really reminded me of the the 18th century dance treatises that I've read because what those dancing masters were trying to do was cultivate in a way awareness in their students of the way that they moved and how to like improve the way that they move if they're like a uh, talbert godfrey talbert and um louis bonan the german dancing masters they really have the beginning of their treatises talking about all the terrible ways that people move and how funny they look and how great you could look if 
you study with the dancing master and learn that, you know, you take a certain length of step or, you know, you are more aware of different bodies in space and how your body, yeah, the, the beauty of turnout in look, making yourself look elegant. Um, but it was mostly body awareness and how to organize your body in a way that was more like socially acceptable to lift up your status. Catherine, um, could you talk oh. a little bit about in your experience um, working with uh, and, and teaching people who are new to the experience and not just uh, dancers, but with your with the idea of stage direction and trying to get sort of an overall frame from the actors and the singers on stage as well as the dancers. What are some of the things that you do to um, to introduce that um, that physicality that that sort of conforms with this Baroque dance style? What are some of the first things that you have them do? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I, um, the first thing I do is try to get them into like, uh, what is the mindset of, of the body and how it moves? And since, uh, some of the dancing masters and other people were looking into aesthetics at that time, were reading uh, Da Vinci's writings um, I like to start with him because you find quite a few dancing books speaking about the Vitruvian man. So the first thing is that I just have people stand in an X like this, uh, recognizing that this is symbolizing the spiritual world. So it's a circle, I'm, I'm, I'm in the circle, and usually I have them define the circle uh, somehow so they feel that, and then remind them that the circle in three dimensions is also a sphere. Um, and there's also, and exists in the uh, material world, which is more in, in the square, and the center of the square would be the hips, uh, would be the genitals to be specific. So I try to get them in touch with that part of their body so the whole thing is not frozen. And just as uh, we're in a square, a square is also a cube, so they have to think of the diagonal shooting through the cube and that the movement uh, it exists on this uh, diagonal space. And once they're getting into these ideas of the geometry and that their body is in the center of this, uh, then they, they begin to have a sense of the space or the hemisphere that they occupy before they express anything. And then I like to go into the very important thing that Vinci writes uh, beneath the Vitruvian man, which is I tell them to go ahead and squeeze the flesh on their body, and that the flesh on their body represents uh, earth or dirt. And as they can feel the bones, bones are like the rocks of the earth. And as they breathe, obviously that's the air, uh, the wind, uh, the excitement of a storm, and that the water is like, uh, Da Vinci says the water is like the blood, and that it, it comes, uh, the water comes from the sea up through the river and into the land. And as the ebb and flow changes, it goes out again. So I try to get them to um, feel that life force or that blood going up through the body, beyond the head. And when it drains, it drains through the feet and then comes down like so. And that that can also happen on a spiral um, either, either way, and um, in addition to that um, idea, the blood flowing with, with a sense of timing, um, that there's another concept of, in the sort of chain of being where man is connecting the earth uh, to the heavens. So man is not an angel, he's not a vegetable, he's not an animal, uh, but he walks upright because in his noble spirit he's connecting the earth with the heavens. So I have them also do an exercise where they feel like the feet are like the roots of the tree and that as you unfold, you're joining the earth with the heavens. And if you're taking that noble walk, uh, you always have that sense. And then speaking of the chain of being, you might think about the moral chain of being. Uh, so they're playing characters. Uh, the characters are found on the spine and you know, like the old hag or old man would be here, and as you went old, your servant is over here. Uh, as you come up to this area here, it's more shepherd, shepherdess, and then here, 
uh, it becomes more noble, noble thoughts as you're connecting the body to the heaven. And then one uh, other thing that I do with them is work with uh, space. And this is a re these are really good exercises just to feel every day in terms of feeling that you're very present in the world uh, to get the emotional part. The upper part of the space would be the spiritual world, happiness, uh, joy, and the gods are over here. In the opposite corner, any kind of uh, uh, fury or bad thing over here. So you're always working with extremes, happiness, sadness, uh, everyday life. And that you can feel that with your eyes. Your eyes can be hopeful. Yes, I hope that Amor is going to listen to me. Just taking them down is no, it's not going to happen. The whole face, I hope Amor is going to listen to me. Taking it down, disappointment. Whole body, yes, Amor, please help me. And don't totally down, it's never going to work. So the, the more, I, I try to work with combinations of things. So if you understand the basic structure and then you add to that and you build it, uh, you're going to get the expression that you need or the dance steps that you're looking for. So I, I try to introduce a system and then that way the students uh, or the performers can take that system and mold it artistically to what it is that they would like to say or accomplish. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, relating this to, to physicality, uh, Peggy, earlier you mentioned that you got into Baroque dance after uh, injury that sort of put you uh, away from the, the ballet and jazz before, but then you've continued to, to, do, to do dance and, and, and period dance was something that came in this sort of post-injury. So how, how did the, is the, was the physicality different? Um, did, it, yeah. did it help with what had happened? How, how did that work into sort of uh, an injury that, that was kind of a, a career ending or changing mm -hmm. moment yeah. to go into that? Exactly. Yeah, uh, well, for me, the allure of historical dance, frankly, is that it's that one isn't required to get one's leg up to one's ear and hold it there or spin on one's head, right? Um, it's in some ways more accessible to people with normal bodies um, who aren't amazingly flexible or have extreme turnout or have extreme muscle tone. Um, I think, and, and I think I bring that to classes I teach too, where I'm dealing with people who don't necessarily have a, ba a dance background, but who may be learning about it for a variety of reasons, but not to become a professional dancer. Um, I think, first of all, any moving is great, but historical dance can do a lot for the body, um, as Catherine just described um, um, very nicely. Uh, there, there's a lot physically and emotionally that can come into it. In many respects, historical dance can be aerobic. It can be a cardio workout. We think of galliards, for example. Um, but even in the very most contained, slow bossa dance, you might not be doing a lot of intricate stepping, but you have to know what you're doing and what comes next. And that kind of memory training and its mind-body connection has got to be great for both the mind and the body. Um, and the other thing that I, I find, especially when I'm teaching something like Renaissance dance, it's very possible to do a lot of steps from a chair. So that even, you know, you can approximate some of the stepping from a chair, so that makes it even more broadly accessible to people. Um, let's see, I think I, I was thinking about something else. Um, I was thinking, I think about historical, um, the historical view of fitness and how it related to dance. And of course, I was thinking of Elizabeth I, who apparently loved to galliard. And as part of her fitness regime, she did galliards every morning uh, to get her heart rate going. Now, I don't know, that could be an urban legend. I have not myself researched it. I don't, maybe, maybe one of you has actually seen where that, uh, where evidence for that is. Um, but I also, it also makes me think too of some of the early, well, the late 15th century Italian uh, dance treatise writers like Guglielmo Ebreo de Pesaro and um, Antonio Cornassano, where 
I believe that they um, did not necessarily separate the physical well-being from the intellectual well-being. Um, I think that they, they seem to propose that technical skill is a combination of being able physically to do it, but also of memory, to be able to remember steps and choreography, having spatial skill to be able to dance, timing with the music, so you have to be able to hear and understand music well, and you have to be able to do all this with a pleasant air about you. So I think all of these things um, to them represented how a human should be fit. So it wasn't just a matter of being physically fit, but it was the whole person being fit. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you brought up something about, um, you know, normal people, normal bodies, um, and I think, uh, if, from what I at least I understand, you know, is that um, the dance and and possibly not, you know, some of the the, the sort of more uh, extreme higher forms of of period dance, but dance was so much more a part of um, of life and culture at the time, um, and uh, it makes me makes me think in my uh, in my own sort of interpretation of this uh, that that some of the, the dance was was meant to be something that could be done by so many more people rather than, like you said, some of these extreme things like pulling your leg up beside your head and, uh, and doing all sorts of things. Um, and, and, uh, and I, and I'm, I'm imagining that that's one of the reasons why we have had such a, a, a great reaction to the sessions that have been offered. And, and in general is the fact that, um, it seems to be an approachable style of dance. Um, and so for someone who is, interested right but doesn't really know where to start what is either um uh, a plate where is some place they can turn uh what are what where would you point them in terms of styles of dances or or things like that where where would you start yeah sarah hi <laughs> so i i think that there are a lot of contra dance groups mm -hmm. in many cities in north america um, and that's kind of a good place to start, even if it's um, like a, a little like farther away, like square dancing. And those kind of dance forms are really related to the contra dances that were done throughout the 18th century. Um, and they could be like Playford dance evenings, uh, English country dancing, or like queer contra nights are like really fun and approachable. And you get the patterns often that we do in 18th century dance, as well as just like the fun community aspect. So if you don't have like one of us teaching in your city, then um, that's kind of a fun place because I think there are a lot more opportunities. Catherine? Um, Caroline Copeland is offering a free Zoom class every Friday at noon, uh, New York City time. And it's more like elements of Baroque dance. And when I say that elements, I mean, seriously, if you can breathe and stand up, you can take her class. And it really is looking at, uh, you know, like the, uh, the elements of the, of the mouvement, you know, it's the, the plie and the releve. And she'll explain, she'll explain it uh, artistically, but so basically that you will get it. So she's not teaching a pavane, she's not teaching a minuet, uh, she's teaching, you know, what is what, what are all the variations on the pot of array? How do you approach that? How does this dancing master describe it? How does how does the other one? And so it's it's just an hour long. It's free, and I think that once you've taken a few lessons from her, that then you could go on to take, uh, you know, a class say from uh, Julia, looking at you know musicality and uh, in a specific dance form. You can go on to Anna. Anna Mansbridge's classes, you know, looking at basic Baroque uh, dances to do. But I, seriously, as an introduction, I think that um, this class really works. And it's you, anybody can uh, go in, it's on Facebook. So just sign up and, and you can take the class in your own home. And if you're uh, joining us right now, I did put the link to that in in the in the comments for uh, for this video right now, so you can watch that. Uh, Marina, you, you had something to add? Yes, uh, yes. So it's very interesting because uh, that's a bit 
how I started to do workshop. I did so many workshops everywhere. And actually now we cannot travel, unfortunately, but often I did workshop for traveling. So I went to Urbino a couple of times. I went if, you know, if you can, but there's many, I mean, if you start to dig, there's many, many things that, that is happening more than, than we think. Even if it's a small world, it's a big world of historical dancing, I find. Um, and now, because of COVID, everybody, a bit like uh, Caroline's doing, doing some uh, workshop online. I'm building a platform of historical dance. It's going to come out in June because it's a lot of, uh, of work, but it's, it's, it's coming. Uh, and this is, this is not replacing classes with teachers. This is just a complement to, to have a, a different look, uh, a different way of learning. Um, but uh, yes, there are more. You just dig a little bit, go in the net, and maybe you will find a broke teacher actually close. And if not, you can do their summer workshops. Uh, I'm not sure if this summer they will start, though, but soon they will come back. <laughs> Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> um, so, uh, Julie, um, in, uh, I want to sort of shift uh, the, the subject just a little bit, uh, because as people who are familiar with uh, Early Music America, many of many of our members and men, many of our followers on, on Facebook are uh, performers of early music, singers or instrumentalists. Um, and as someone who is a broke violinist and leads ensembles and is also a dancer um, and has been asked many times to sort of address this topic, how do you see knowledge of these Baroque or earlier dance forms as an integral part of the interpretation of the music itself? Oh boy, that is a big question and it's my total yeah. life. You know, this is what I do. <laughs> it's like 24 hours every day. This is what I think about. Um, and, but I do have to say the more that I do Baroque dance and I've been teaching it uh, pretty solidly for 12 years now at Case, um, Every time I, I find something else about it that reflects directly to the music. And what I'm really into now is phrasing, because it's not just how the steps match the phrasing, but which steps are used in which part of the phrase. And it's also based on expectation, because the more choreographies that I look at, the more I can expect a certain phrasing to happen. And one of these, I'll just give one example. Like I said, I could just go on forever about, about this. But one of the examples is for most dance types, in the A section, you have a four bar phrase and followed by another four bar phrase. And then you might have something a little bit longer and then you have the cadence. So, and each phrase is made up of four parts. I'm all about fours, right? So the four parts are action, reaction, contrast, cadence. And that almost always happens in what we would expect of a four bar phrase in Baroque dance as well as in the music. Um, and you can apply these fours not only to phrases but to sections within the A section and also to the entire piece even if it's a bite part partite piece. Um, so in the second section then you would have longer phrases and sometimes you don't see that in the music but you almost always see it in the dance. Um, so that is just one thing that I'm, I'm really just kind of psyched to, to keep exploring. Um, and then also, very basically, you know, Baroque dance never stops, right? There is a flow to it. You are, are always in motion, even if you have a, a stop to a, 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 you know, a first position and you stop. There's always some sort of reaction, little or, or big after that that keeps the motion going and this is so important to musicians to know that you don't stop the bow right you might add more or less air right but you never stop the motion because once you stop the motion then you have to make a big effort to start it again um, and then finally i'll just say one more thing it's about the natural movement right so the the all the the movements in baroque dance come from nature if you think about it, and each movement has its own rhythm, and not only one rhythm uh, or flow, but it, it might start 
fast and then go slow and then speed up, or it might start slow and then speed up. You know, this is just a simple step. You know, you can take a step and analyze it to that point. And that reflects, again, I'm talking as a violinist because, well, that's what I've done all my life. But with the bow, that's what happens with the bow. You don't have just one speed with the bow. You might have four speeds with the bow, depending on what shape you want to make it. And I can see this also in the steps of the dance. So this, these are the sorts of things that, that constantly come to me while I do both teaching music and dance um, every semester. And Peggy, I, I'm going to go to you a little bit for this too, because of your involvement with like Madison or the Music Festival and Amherst uh, uh, workshops, uh, and the fact that you're doing this in the midst of these workshops where most people uh, are coming to to play or or sing. Um, so how how do how do you see your work at these festivals and workshops uh, fitting into sort of the overall um, the overall musical experience of it, and and what are some of the ways that you work with um, what I'm guessing is uh, singers and instrumentalists who who are wanting to learn this so that they can apply things that like Julie was just saying. Right, exactly. I think a lot of times the people with whom I work, uh, it's their very first experience with with any kind of historical movement at all. Um, so it's a matter. It's multifold. Uh, it's a matter of giving them a little bit about the context so they have a sense of what it is we're trying to build, but also um, for them to try the steps is just so valuable. Um, I, I have had so many musicians say, my gosh, I never, I've played a hundred million minuets, but I really never thought about how to phrase it because I've never done a minuet step before. So teaching the actual steps and trying to lace combinations together so that, for example, what Julie was just saying, they get the sense that you can't just stop at a certain point. And the other thing that they start to realize is you can't really slow down when somebody is standing in standing on their the balls of their feet balancing. You can't can't slow down right then, right? You have to keep it even and keep it going, right? It's things like that that people um, people tend to find value in. Um, mm -hmm. And it can be just a, a really small experience for them, but I think it's very valuable. So I want to I want to ask each of you because I'm sure each of you might have a different example of this. But relating to that is how how to um, to to not uh, slow down when someone's on the balls of their feet. But what is an example of a, of a of um, if you were going to talk to a musician who is going to be playing for you um, in a particular uh, in a particular dance movement or or whatever? What um, what would what would you say that's something that would allow them to make what you do easier as opposed to them just interpreting the music without dance as as a part of their thought? So I'll give you a, a moment, unless anyone has something that immediately jumps to mind or, or an experience that they want to do, give me just a moment to think about that um, and I'll clarify. So what, what are um, some common pitfalls? That might be a better way to say, it. what are some common pitfalls? I saw uh, Catherine, I think you raised. Um, well, I work a lot with opera, and a lot of the dance there is is expressive, and it's linked to a character. Um, so I talk with them about um, you know certain passages in the music, and what does that mean? How does it relate to the narrative? How does it relate to the dynamics? And you know what's happening with this piece of music? So, for instance, um, in Le Temple de la Gloire, we had um, a gavotte, and in you know, I think it was in Act One. And it just looked like it was a kind of a regular gavotte, except the middle of it, you know, it would play and play and play. And then there would be a little interruption um, of the form where it was like a question came out and then it just sort of receded. And so I talked to them a little bit like, okay, why is Ramo writing it that way? Why is he not just going A, A, B, B, let's do it again? Why is there that interruption? And then I sort of put that into the context that the dancers were, uh, you know, followers uh of the muses but they were shepherds and shepherdesses and they were waiting for the return of um you know the general of the army to come to say whether he was going to go to war or not so obviously that little hesitation was not just gee what should i do it was more um 
uh, you know, fraught with uh, being, you know, am I going to be living? Am I going to live after this? Or am I going to die? Am I going to have to go to war? So I think when you put it into the context of what the drama is uh, for the music, uh, then they can uh, relate to uh, that, you know, the, the sense of how, how to play, you know, how do you get that sense of mystery or that sense of anticipation? And, um, and Julie, Julie was sort of mentioning this before when she was talking about action, reaction, contrast, and then cadence. I mean, that very much is a sort of literary form too. You know, what is the statement? How do you answer that? What's, what's the conflict and then what happened? And pretty much that's in every piece. And it's either abstract or it's expressive and dramatic. So I try to talk about the music in, in those ways uh, just to get um, you know, the spirit of it out. Other, other experiences or, or pitfalls to avoid? Anyone? Yeah, Marie Nathalie. Uh, um, yes, I, I mean, I relate so much to Julie when she, think, when she uh, ta uh, talked about phrasing because Baroque is all about the phrasing and not the phrasing, the classical phrasing, but the Baroque phrasing, which is often more short, short. And so working with musician is very interesting because when you choreograph, then you choreograph, you can adjust to the tempo they take a little bit. But when you work with the notation, then the notation tells you that you're in the air, so they cannot breathe there, you're in the air. Um, and the notation as well was, was notated for that music in particular. So I really found, find that sometimes the notation itself, uh, if, if it's what we're working, will tell you how to play uh, certain tempos. Like lure, if you play a lure too fast, you just cannot do two step per measure because a lure is the same is the same music as a jig <laughs> it's the same rhythm as a jig but if you play it and and if you play a lure fast it sounds great <laughs> but then you just cannot do the step so then if you play it for the dancer you realize that pa -pum, -pim, pa -pum, it becomes something else um, so that's what actually is very interesting, that work with the musicians to, to say, okay, so look what I'm doing and see my phrasing, my dance phrase go all the way to there. What about yours and does it goes together? And I don't repeat A the same. It's rare in the dance that we repeat the same steps. I, well, not in the notation. As, or sometimes you repeat the step, but in a different spacing. So oh, there's something different about it. And then they make a little change. Um, so, and, but of course, when you experiment it, like Peggy said, when they do menuet step and they realize that it's six beats, so it's two measure and you have to phrase, when you listen to a menuet after, you just hear the two phrasing. And you, so you hear the big phrase, but you hear the little phrase of the two measures. Um, so it's very, it's very interesting to do it. Uh, to, uh, like uh, Julie said, to really do it, to be able to feel it in your body. So then it changed how you play as well, because you, when you do it in the space, you something, something will stay from this. So you will learn something, even if you're not doing, uh, I know Julie can dance as she play at the same time, but <laughs> that's another thing. But you will you will feel the movement you did. There, There's something that it's in your body that will stay there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Peggy or Sarah, anything to add? I just had so the first thought that came to my mind is super simple and that's just to like be clear with the downbeat mm. when you're playing oh. with the dancers. I mean Catherine and Marie Natalie went like really beautifully detailed into other parts, but like sometimes people wonder if they can play inigal with dancers. And I don't really always know how to quite answer that because it depends on your relationship with the musician. And if you can work it out together, but like in general, um, the dancer doesn't know like where you're going if you're not doing the small Baroque phrasing that matches the dance. So um, yeah, clear downbeat, especially on Gavats. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> could well, I, 
yep. can I um, just say something about that? You know, because as a musician dancer and knowing this French style, I've personally never had any problem with Inégal because from the Inégal, maybe it's because they're doing it wrong, but really the Inégal is um, one level underneath what the dancer usually does. So for example, it might be on the 16th note level and the dancer's dancing on basically the eighth note level. And so for me as a dancer player, um, I really need the Inégal to get the flow and the, the movement um, throughout throughout the dance. So I'm sure that there are some other times when it could be a problem, but um, I've, I've never experienced that myself. Um, and another thing that I'd really like to mention is that, you know, so far, I don't think anybody has mentioned, you know, to play for dancers, you have to be in strict time and in this oh. tempo, right? <laughs> That's the first question I get from musicians. What's the tempo? You know, that should be probably maybe the fourth or fifth question. You know, first of all, as everybody's been saying, it's what is this dance? What is the essence of this dance? And uh, we've been kind of exploring, Catherine and, and others have been exploring, what's the meaning of cadence? And to, to me, the, the meaning of cadence is just this very thing. You know, what is the essence of each of these dances? Um, and once they can understand that, then they can go on to, you know, exploring that essence. But tempo, there is a certain tempo that works, but you don't really need to be strict about it. You know, you don't, it's not a metronome. We love taking time in between phrases and to really make it expressive as if it's an extension of the music. And this is one thing I talk about, about with my musicians is that uh, Baroque dance is kind of a 3D version of the music that is being played. It's an additional layer. It adds rhythm, it adds movement, it adds uh, phrase lengths, everything. So it's, it's not music, dance, but it's this combination of the two that work together very musically. Mm -hmm. I often like to tell musicians that the dance, it's the dance line, that we're performing the dance line in the orchestra uh, score. I think too that, I mean, one of the things that has to be clear to everybody involved that the is that this is collaborative. I mean, you, you have to be there to work with the dancers and the dancers have to be there to work with the music, musicians and not expect that they're going to bow to your, to your preference and vice versa. You know, it's, it's, this is a work, you're actually workshopping everything. You're there to learn how to put it together. And, you know, and it, it occurs to me that you know, the importance of, of rhetoric in the Baroque period and in Baroque music and in Baroque dance becomes a physical manifestation in, in the dance. Uh, and I think that's one thing that uh, when, I, when I work with students just in terms of music is to, is to bring that aspect out. And when we, I, I think, uh, and I, I'm, uh, I think it was Peggy who, who mentioned uh, the idea of, of or no, it was uh, Marie Nathalie of, of being able to remember a, a gesture because you've physically done it, because it's now it's now a part of your of your muscle memory, and then being able to to interpret the music in the way that is appropriate for that because you have physically done this, and so. Um, Many of you have worked with or continue to work with stage direction with the, the sort of full uh, full representation, dance, acting, singing, uh, and, and, and then the instrumental music that's going along with this. Um, and I, I feel like many times people, when they think of Baroque dance, they think that the experience has to be this sort of, we're in the middle of an opera. Um, but that wasn't obviously always the experience at the time that Baroque dance came about. So how can, how, how would you, uh, each of you think about um, how to help people bring this to uh, a manageable um, uh, idea of being involved with this. It's not something that they need to, you know, have the the, the Paris Opera or something like that. Um, what are what are some what are some entries into this? And we have uh, only about ten minutes left in the in the discussion. And so, what are some other entryways? We talked about the workshops in this, but um, how can people begin to grasp? early dance. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, um, I, I really think that we covered it because it, they, I think everyone really does need to try it uh, on some level. I don't think this is something that you can learn cerebrally. I think you really need to experience it. And, um, you know, Catherine was talking about Caroline's class and what she does. And I think that would be a fantastic place for people to start, you know, just this idea of the basic movement through the phrases, you know, and just getting loosened up and, and, and moving through um, any sort of movement through uh, the music would be helpful. But I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell my students to go to Caroline's class first, you know, <laughs> and to Peggy's class because it's, it's just very, very important. And I, I do that at workshops too now. I, I'm not teaching all the steps anymore as I did. I start with just this general movement as well. So um, I mean, that's my answer. Maybe other people have other answers. Marie, Natalie, I saw you. <laughs> Sorry, my, my mute. Um, yes, and actually, that's how I started to teach. Um, uh, a student from McGill called me uh, many years ago and said, okay, I'm doing my master in violin. You have to teach. And I was like, no, 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 no. I have to know it was Olivier Bro, Julie, you know him. So Olivier said, no, you just have to teach. I need, I have to know to dance because I'm doing the historical. <laughs> so he made me teach. So, um, so yes, I think it's really to try to go, try to find a, a class and uh, Caroline gives one and Peggy gives some uh, just to get in touch with it. And that's how I started to, it was out of interest. I was a musician too. And I said, I, my teachers tell me, Play the menuet like it's a dance. You you dance, Marie Nathalie. You should play the menuet like it's a dance. And I was like, yes, but what? <laughs> what does it mean? So that's how I got interested, just like this. And then you never know, you could become a baroque dancer. <laughs> never know. Yeah, I, I want to mention. I'm, I'm sorry. Go I, ahead. I was just going to say that I think that, ironically. Through the pandemic, we've had more access to dance and community than we normally do. Um, many of us prior to this uh, pandemic experience could only attend, if we're lucky, one Baroque, one you know class at a Baroque dance festival every Summer. And that was it. Expected to get any better if that's all you ever get, if you don't happen to live in a city where there is a Baroque dance community. But I think the pandemic has changed a lot. And I, I also have to say, and I'm gonna I'm gonna plug Caroline's class too. When she started that class, things had just closed down, everybody had lost gigs, and nobody knew what was next. And so for Caroline to start that class and 95 people from across the world, many of whom you knew and many of whom you didn't know, were there all together and creating community as we danced together. And I think that that is really important in and of itself. So I think, and since then, there are also many more um, opportunities to dance online. Mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage people to check out I don't know, message boards about Baroque dance. There's a there's a Facebook page called Baroque Dance where a lot of people post their um, their classes that they're offering. Um, and many of them are free. Um, I do, however, think that Baroque dancers need to be paid too. So don't, yeah. don't take that too seriously. Well, and I'll point out that um, coming up here in just about an hour, you can have an opportunity uh, and uh, Peggy is leading our next uh, sort of hands-on, uh, virtually hands-on uh, Baroque dance sessions that we're offering free as part of the wellness session, uh, a wellness series, and that's coming up in, in just an hour at 4 p.m. Uh, uh, Eastern time, and you can find out about that at our website, and I'll put the link in here again uh, uh, very, uh, very soon. We are also going to take, um, we have many resources that the panelists here have, uh, have supplied, and I'm going to condense those, and I will put that on the wellness, uh, uh, the well-tempered musician webpage uh, at earlymusicamerica.org/wellness, along with the uh, recording uh, of today's panel, so that 
you can find uh, some some uh, visual res uh, representation. You can find classes and, and these, and we can uh, create a small resource there as well. Um, in the last few minutes, we do have a couple of questions. Um, and I want to uh, ask this one first. This one actually is um, uh, much more specific, but I thought it would be an interesting uh, thing to talk about. And I'm, um, this is uh, asking about um, dance forms that are uh, an audible form of the counterpoint to instrumental parts. And are there other examples of this in European repertoire? And I know that's a very different kind of question than what we've been talking about, um, but I think it relates to this, this meeting of, of, of uh, the understanding of the music and the dance. So does anyone, uh, yes. Catherine? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, you should check out Ana Yepes, who's looking at uh, Spanish dance during the Golden Age, and definitely with her castanet playing and foot stomping, uh, she would have quite a lot to relay to you. And uh, I don't think it was necessarily limited to Spain because uh, of these sort of intermarriages, you know, through the, the courts. Uh, you know, certainly the French uh, loved the style of Spanish dance and made their own, choreographed their own Spanish dances. And we have to ask ourselves how much of that uh, castanet playing, et cetera, with, did they include? Uh, also, the Italians were playing castanets quite a bit, and in their own folk dancing, the you know the stomping of the foot is um, is very important. So it's not um, so it, yeah, it is in the European repertoire. Julie, and if I can say a little bit more about dance in general, um, what I'm discovering is that most of the steps that the dancers do are in a different rhythm than the treble part of the music. So we are dancing counter to rhythms almost all the time. And oftentimes we give a beat when the treble line doesn't have it. So um, it's it's really counterpoint the full way, I, I think. Um, and there are several examples of that um, in the repertoire. The, the biggest one is the pas pied that has a hebiola in the middle of it Minuets often have a hemiola at the end of the phrase. Pas pieds have them in the middle. And one thing that it starts in the middle of a minuet step. Pas pieds use minuet steps. This starts in the middle of the step and goes over the hemiola as if, you know, there's no hemiola there. And it's the weirdest feeling in the world to have to dance against that hemiola. Um, but that's that's one big example of, of this counter rhythm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that one of some of the uh, um, sort of uh, looking into the connection between traditional dance and then the court dances, court dances, it's said by uh, Pierre Rameau that the court dances are um, inspired or based or come forth from these traditional dances of particular regions. And I, I find that um, right now, um, dancers who are involved in recovering historical dances are, are looking into more deeply into these connections between traditional performances of these dance forms and how did that affect what was going on in the court or how might it affect what was going on in the court. And one last also, one last question. Also, oh, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Peggy. I just wanted to, you know, piggyback on that. I, I also think that um, it's important in and of itself because when we look only at the courtly or, or the noble style, we're looking at the dance of a very small mm. sliver of the population. And it's very important to wonder what everybody else was up to. One last one last question, and I'm sure everybody here will have, uh, will have uh, a comment on it. And so maybe we can uh, uh, reduce it uh, as much as possible. But uh, we had a question on the importance of, of footwear. Um, so what what how does that how does that apply uh, to to Baroque dance to, to period dance? It is important. <laughs> uh, it needs to be flexible. Um, there are questions about the height of the heel, and you can see in the paintings that, um, I mean, sometimes if you see something that's like, you know, really that high, it might be a fashion style as opposed to what they actually wore. Uh, I believe it's um, Edmund Fairfax who has a fixation about footwear and uh, he'll talk about, you know, wearing a, a soft shoe with a, with a small heel, both for men and for women. Uh, yes. Maria, Natalie. Yes, uh, 
Yes, it's interesting. Uh, Rameau, uh, Pierre Rameau says that uh, when you know how to plié and élevé, you, you know how to dance. So if I relate to the shoes, when you plié, depending of how your, te your tendon d'Achille, ten Achilles tendon. Yes, are, uh, when you have a little heel, it certainly helps. Now, of course, at the period they had letter sole. Uh, I, do we know if it was very soft or it was like good? And it depends if you dance at the court and all this. So I think is to be comfortable. But of course, the heel change a little bit. But if you have good tendons, you can be flat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and if you do Renaissance, it's a it's a different uh, it's a different shoes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, it's it's just now right at the hour. Um, and if anyone who's watching or watches uh, in the uh, archived version of this has questions, you can feel free to reach out to Early Music America and we can uh, relay your question if you have a specifically uh, to one of our panelists um, or more generally, we can help you uh, to find an answer. But you can just go to our website, earlymusicamerica.org and use the contact form uh, to send us a message and just put um, put dance in the, uh, in the message and, and we'll get that to the right person because obviously these conversations could go on and on and on. Um, and we would love to have another uh, discussion uh, in, in the not too distant future as, uh, as there's so much more that we could be talking about. Uh, but we're going to uh, say goodbye for now. So I would like to thank uh, Peggy, Sarah, Julie, Marie, Natalie, and Catherine uh, for being a part of our panel today uh, and for helping to sort of uh, give us even more context uh, into this. And I will once again uh, put a link here to the, the session that we have coming up in one hour. Um, and this is in the comments, uh, and you can register for free uh, to experience Baroque dance on your own uh, via Zoom with the camera on or off, however you want to uh, to do that. So you can uh, feel free to to learn privately or or uh, be seen by Peggy during that time. And we'll have other future sessions that will be coming up, and you can watch our website earlymusicamerica.org um, for that as those uh, as those are arranged. I'll also draw your attention uh, to uh, the Well Tempered Musician web page, uh, which is earlymusicamerica.org slash wellness, where you can find out about uh, upcoming uh, uh, other upcoming events. We are going to be extending this series into our regular programming uh, as part of Early Music America's programming throughout the year. Um, we've been uh, really focusing on two to three or even four events every week in the last three months. And so we're going to dial back a little bit, but we, we want to continue uh, to offer these uh, wellness activities as a part of our year-round programming. Uh, and so we invite you to visit the website and find more about that. Um, so once again, thank you uh, to our panel for being here today. And thank you everyone who has been joining us. And we hope to, uh, to see you all in the near future. Bye, everybody. <laughs>